I'll have my mansion now. Oh, I believe. Oh, I believe. Oh, I believe. Oh, Lord, and I'll have my mansion now. Welcome to our worship experience this morning. We ask that you find your seats uh, so we can get our minds and hearts prepared to worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Amen. Amen. As a means of responsive reading, I'll read from the 100th Division of Psalm. The 100th Division of Psalm. Psalms 100. You will repeat after me. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us. And not we ourselves. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates for thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful, Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Bless his For, the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. Mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. Let the church say amen. amen. Truly, we know that God is a good God and that he blessed us to be here on this morning. And uh, for that, we ought to give him all the worship and the praise. Don't sit on your amens. Don't hold back your hallelujahs because God has brought us here today. Yes, I'm clinging to him. 
come from the book of Acts, the chapter is 3, and the verses are 1 through 6. It is Acts, the third chapter, the verses are 1 through 6. And it reads, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Yeah, yeah. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried womb that lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, mm -hmm. who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Mm -hmm. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Amen. May it be a blessing to the hearers, not only hearers, but doers of his divine word. Church together, will we all stand for prayer? Amen. Father, we thank you again this morning so much for your grace and mercy, Father. God, we thank you for the sunshine and even the cold that we've had, Father. Father, we pray for everything that you've blessed us with. We sing the song. We want to thank you, God. I, I'm, I'm very thankful for everything that you've done from our early existence to this present moment, Father. God, we thank you for our families. We thank you for the church. Father, we thank you for everything that you've given us that we sometimes take for granted, Father. Father, we ask if it's your divine will, those that have made requests concerning their health, concerning bereavement, concerning any issue that you know about that we don't know about, that you would intervene, God, and we know that whatever you do is done well. Father, we ask this morning, if it's your divine will, that you would bless uh, your servant as he come before us, God, and break unto us the bread of life, Father. We pray that you would give him longevity of life, God. Allow him to be Lord into your storehouse of wisdom, Father. Grant his head with wisdom and knowledge, and Father, give him humility 
And I'm on this as a preacher word, Father. Father, continue to go with us and keep us as we seek to do your will, Father. And I pray that we would be a light uh, to those that are in darkness, Father. Continue to go with us. Continue to stand by us. So I pray in Jesus' name. And for Christ's sake, amen. amen. Say amen. Let the church say amen again. Let the church say, Let it rise. Y'all you know, singing this morning, letting the spirit rise among us. The song says, Let the praises to our king rise among us. Let it rise. Now, if that's not your king, I can understand why you don't have no praises rising among you. But if he is your king, if he is your Lord, if he's kept you, brought you a mighty long way, you ought to let the spirit rise. God is indeed good, and we thank him for another day. Uh, on this side of, the, uh, of time's uh, uh, demarcation, he's, he's kept us and he's brought us uh, to see another day. And for that, we're eternally, eternally grateful. On yesterday, we had the opportunity uh, to share in with Sister Spratt as we laid her daughter Regina uh, to rest a uh, memorial service on yesterday. And I want to thank you all who have called and prayed and those who were able to show up on yesterday uh, just to support uh, that family. Yes. It's very difficult when you're uh, in the midst of loss in that moment uh, to maybe see what's going on around you, but in the days to come, they will remember uh, the memory of knowing that you cared uh, in that hour. In the same vein, I ask you to keep Sister Johnson in your prayers, uh, the loss of uh, her husband as well, uh, that we uh, can support her as well uh, in the days to come. And then on yesterday afternoon, uh, we took our young folk to Tulsa and uh, went to visit Black Wall Street and the Greenwood Rising Museum. And I tell you, uh, I enjoyed the museum, but Brother Reynolds went with us, I tell you, he, he did, He's, yes indeed. Uh, I enjoyed the museum, I enjoyed uh, walking down Black Wall Street and the AME Church and all those other things, but I tell you, them kids on that van tested my gangster on the way home last night. <laughs> I had to say to my, they just being kids, they just, why is it bothering me? They just being kids. Kids are loud like that. Kids don't go to sleep. Kids just talk. Kids want to eat candy. <laughs> we had a great time. One of the things that I enjoyed most was Jill, Jill was uh, challenging, the, challenging the children as we got back on the van, uh, as we were going to eat, and asking them what they learned. And parents, I want to encourage you to ask your kids what they learned. Our kids are extremely perceptive. Uh, they were extremely engaged. Uh, and we had a great time on yesterday. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. I want to thank all of the adults that went with us. We had a good number of adults uh, that went with us. Uh, uh, they drove separately, but they went with us. <laughs> Acts chapter 3. Acts, <laughs> Acts, <laughs> Acts chapter 3. <laughs> uh, we'll begin at verse number one, reading from the New King James Version on this morning. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he, being the man, gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. 
Verse 7 says, and he took him by the right hand, and he lifted him up, and he immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. Verse 6 again, Peter uh, said, a silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and walk. And he took him by the right hand, and he lifted him up, and immediately, somebody said immediately, immediately. his feet and ankle bones received strength. Sometimes in my life I feel like I'm alone. Everybody has gone away. And I'm a long, long way from home. Oh, but I know a man will never leave no matter. I have a 
a father. I have a home. I have a boy. It's prepared for me. Yes, I do, Lord, and until I get there. So I shall not want to never fear. For Jesus is with me. Me and the Lord, my God and I, I humbly bow. Yes, I do, Lord. Crosby, who wrote the song Blessed Assurance, and we, and we talked about how she battled through blindness and all this difficulty in her life to still declare that this was her story and that this was her song. If you remember, we talked about the fact that this is your story and nobody can handle your pen That's right. but you. And I want to continue in that thought on this morning as we continue to look at this is my story, this is my song. I'm, I'm reminded of, of music of old. I'm reminded of, of Saturday morning music. I don't know about in your home, but in the home I grew up, and I assume that most of you grew up in, uh, Saturday morning cleanup music was different than any other kind of y'all ain't saying nothing. There's some songs that can come on the radio right now, and you say to yourself, my mama used to play this when we were in the vacuum in the floor. My daddy used to play this when we were cleaning up the house. This was what he had on, on the radio. This is what she had on. Y'all don't, don't have no cleanup music. Did y'all just vacuum in silence? Okay, all right. So you can hear some songs, and it reminds you of yesterday. I, I was riding down to, to, to this is pre-pandemic, uh, riding down to Little Rock to preach, and I took Brother Reynolds with me because he's from Little Rock, and, and when uh, he wanted to go see family, but when you take Brother Reynolds with you, there's a barbecue joint there that's real good that his family owns, so if you take Brother Reynolds with you, you get a little extra than what you pay for. So I wanted him to ride with me, right? And we're riding down to Little Rock, and, 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 and I turned on Pandora on my phone, Jonathan, and I put it on the Delphonics station. Y'all ain't got no Delphonics fans up in here, right? See, what Pandora does is it plays that artist in any like artist, right? Right? So, you know, all these, these old hits came on, Brother Leo, and Brother Riddle's just sitting there. He just tapping. Five hours. And every so often, in between that, you know, us having a conversation, you hear him in the distance. Bet you by golly, why? You know, I'm not going to play Brother Riddle's. Right? A couple minutes later, you know, step right on in. Da -da 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 -da. Right? He's in his own world. Right? Because the music reminded him of days of old. It put him at peace. It put him at, it reminded him of a happy place. 
in his life. It reminded him of a time when life was simple for him, when it wasn't complicated, where he could just be Jack and not have to deal with nothing else. But as those songs begin to play, Jonathan, every so often, you know, smoking can baby, let's cool. And I'm like, Brother Riddle, you know all these songs. It wasn't a song he didn't know the word to. Right? And he asked me every so often after my four or five, now how do you get all that on your car? I said, Brother Riddle, just pay hey, I'm trying to explain to him. But it reminded him of a good time. When I look at this text, this text reminds me, uh, as, I, as I consider the larger uh, landscape of this is my story, this is my song, uh, no, no coincidence, February, right? Uh, it reminded me of, of a song of my old. Uh, there was Saturday morning at our house uh, after whatever sport took place. Uh, when you got home, you had to do some cleaning up. Yeah. But nine times out of ten, you were going to find Brother Jones out in the garage. He was welding something. He was fixing. Most times, Brother Saturday, he was fixing something that couldn't be fixed. But he was fixing something. Uh, he would do stuff like go buy your broken lawnmower, bring it home to see if he can fix it, and then try to sell it back. You know, stuff like that. But he would be in the garage. I'm not talking about nobody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. He would be in there trying to fix stuff in the garage, right? So you knew if you went outside, the garage door was going to be up. And whatever he was playing is what you were listening to. Right? People ask me all the time, why are you such an old soul? Because I grew up listening to, to, to Marvin Gaye and the Carpenters. <laughs> right? right? People like that. Right? But, hey, hey uh, the Bee Gees. Right? But there was a song that used to play all the time on Saturday. Saturday, this is before you had playlists. Words of the song went like this. Ain't there something I can give you in exchange for everything you give me? Read my mind and make me feel just fine when I think my peace of mind is out of reach. Y'all don't know this one, huh? The scales are sometimes unbalanced when you bear the weight of all that has to be. I hope that you can see that you can lean on me and together we can calm the stormy. There we go. We love so strong and so unselfishly. And I tell you now that I've made a vow. I'm giving you the best that I got. Baby, 1988 Anita Baker. Seemed like Anita Baker. I don't know if it's because we was in Michigan and she was in Detroit. It just seemed like every Saturday you were going to hear Anita Baker on the radio giving you the best that I got now. Now, in Anita Baker's song, Brother Riddle, she's talking to the love of her life. She's trying to get him to understand that, that I know that you've been loving me. And I'm trying to love you too. She says, she says together we can calm the stormy sea. Right? She says, we, we, we love so strong and so unselfishly. I'm telling you now that I've made a vow. I'm giving you the best that I got. As I consider my life, I know someone who can calm the raging sea. A long time ago, Calvary's cross, <laughs> matter of fact, before Calvary's cross, John chapter 3, verse number 16, he made a vow. He, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He made a vow that he was going to be giving me the best that he had. Every now and again, I've got to ask myself as I look at this text, as I write my story, as I own my song, am I giving God the best that I got? Am I giving my family the best that I got? Am I giving this community side the best that I got? For just a couple moments on this morning, I want to speak to you from the subject, giving you the best, the best I got. Peter said, silver and gold, silver and gold I don't have, but I'm going to give you the best that I got. Three things that this text teaches us, and we'll be, we'll be, in, we'll be in and out on this morning. Uh, Tulsa took the life literally out of me. Uh, 
Three things we'll see in the text, and then the lesson will be yours. Uh, uh, if you're the note-taking type, you can write these down. The first thing we see here, uh, if you're going to give the best that you, that you, that you got, you've got to understand that sometimes you'll have a crippling condition. There's a crippling condition in this text. Sometimes your condition ain't favorable. Sometimes what you got to go through in life will, will knock the wind out of you. Not only does the text teach us about a crippling condition, but it also shows us a challenging conversation. Goodness gracious, it does you no good to acknowledge your condition and not be willing to talk about it. There's a challenging conversation. Not only does the text teach us about a crippling condition and a challenging uh, conversation, but lastly, and then the lesson will be yours. It demonstrates for us a life-changing confrontation. A crippling condition, a challenging conversation, which should lead us to a life-changing confrontation. It's one thing to know what's wrong. It's another thing to be willing to talk about what's wrong. But it's something all far greater to do something about what's wrong. Uh, as we dive into the text on this morning, uh, we dive into the third chapter of the book of Acts, and we find ourselves uh, on the heels of what is probably one of the most powerful uh, moments in Scripture. Uh, Acts chapter 2 is probably one of the most uh, powerful uh, displays of God's power and his might uh, as the church is established, you're familiar with Acts chapter 2. The Bible tells us at the beginning of Acts chapter 2 that when the day of Pentecost uh, had fully come, the Bible says they were all accord and in one place. The Bible says that uh, suddenly uh, a sound came from heaven. The Bible says it was like a mighty rushing wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I love the way that the Bible says that as that sound filled the room, that the Lord then gave them some talents that they didn't have before. It said that each of them were given tongues as, as fire, and it sat upon them. The Bible says that as they got up and they began to speak to the people on the day of Pentecost, well, everybody was able to hear them. In, y'all know that story? Able to hear them in their own language. Able to hear them in their own tongue. The Bible says that after uh, they began uh, to speak, after Peter's sermon, uh, they begin to ask the question, what must we do to be saved? He tells them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. The Bible goes on at the end of chapter 2, and it says they continued uh, day by day, talked about how they sold their stuff and had everything in common and made sure that nobody walked for nothing. But I love the way when Acts chapter 2 ends, it tells us that they continued baptizing folks and that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so it's, it's right after the establishment of the church that we see this particular text taking place. The Bible says, now Peter and John went to the temple uh, at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. I'll say that again. Now Peter and John went to, uh, together to the temple uh, at the hour of prayer. Bible says it was the ninth hour. Okay, I'll say it one more time. Uh, now Peter and John went up to the temple together at the hour of prayer. The Bible says that it was the ninth hour. Well, why are they going to pray and why are they praying right now? They're praying because it's what folks who follow the Lord do. If you're a Christian, you have a regular prayer life. But let me tell you this. Before Acts chapter 2, they had a regular prayer life. And so they were continuing in what it is that they normally do. Matter of fact, if you remember uh, when we found Paul in uh, Acts 15 on that missionary journey, uh, excuse me, Acts uh, uh, 16 last week when we talked uh, that he was uh, going to pray, right, when, when that encounter happened. But I want you to see this. Bible says they're going to pray and it's happening when? Ninth hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the ninth hour. Bible says they're going to pray at the ninth hour. Now that is important because it's not just because they're going to pray at the ninth hour hour out of habit, but they're going to pray at the ninth hour because the ninth hour means something to them. 
I read somewhere in Mark's gospel, Brother Reynolds said when they took my Lord and Savior and they beat him and they whipped him and took him from hall to hall and they put a crown of thorns upon his head and they put nails in his hands and nails in his feet and he hung upon that old rugged cross. The Bible says that when the night hour came, Jesus finally gave up the ghost and he says, it is finished. I wish you could see this. So what they are doing is they are going to pray to remember the sacrifice that Jesus uh, made for them. They're going at the night hour because they don't ever want to forget what Jesus did for them. When is the last time in your life you revisited something that was not pleasant, something that was not nice, something that brought you some pain, something that brought you some tears and said, let me pray back at this place, back at this time, because I don't ever want to forget what God brought me through in this moment. Too often times we hide from the pain. We hide from the difficulty. We hide from the ninth hour in our life. But the Bible said that they made it a habit to go back at the ninth hour just in case they got in there, Brother Riddles, and somebody asked them, what are y'all doing here? Playing at the ninth hour. It was an evangelistic opportunity for them to say, well, let me tell you why we come at the ninth hour. Let me tell you, spiritually speaking, Eastside, in the same vein, when you become mature enough to visit the pain that once hurt you, that once brought you tears, that once made you angry and be able to pray about it and open up about it, now it becomes an evangelistic opportunity. Tell me about how you dealt with that. Tell me about how God brought you over. The Bible says that they were going to pray together at the temple the ninth hour. The Bible says a certain lame man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they laid at the temple, which is called Beautiful. Laid him at the temple gate, which is called Beautiful. I need you to understand that the Bible is intentional about not telling us this man's name. The Bible says a certain man. Don't tell us who he is, where he's come from, who his folks are, any of that. The Bible says a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried. See, they brought him to a gate every day and they called that gate beautiful. And the gate is called beautiful because of the size and the magnitude and the majesty of the gate. But they brought him to the gate every day, a man lame from his mother's womb. The Bible is intentional not telling you this man's name. Because it's important for us to not get caught up on who he was and not miss out with what he was. Oh, I'll say that again. Sometime, if you are careful, you'll get caught up on who he was and you'll miss what he was. Oh, goodness gracious, but doesn't that not sound like our lives? Folks cannot know your name, but they'll know your condition. Oh, that's, that's, that's such and such as X. Oh, you're the one that was dealing with such and such problem. Oh, you're the one that we, we helped out. You're the one that's fighting that, 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 that. Folk won't know your name, but they'll know your condition. Don't, don't, they, they can know you by face and know what, the, what it is you're dealing with and what it is you got going on. Oh, goodness gracious. Bible says that this man was lame from birth. And I want you to see this. This man is not like the paralytic man at the beginning of, 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 of Mark. This is not the, the, like the man that is born of four and brought to Jesus and they have to take the roof off. That man uh, was, was, was paralyzed, had no, no, no usage of his limbs, no control of his bodily functions. But the word in this text here, polos, speaks to being deprived of foot. His only ailment was that he couldn't use his feet. Come back. He was lame, yes, Sister Pete, but his only ailment was that he couldn't use his feet. He's not making sense to you. In other words, the Bible supports this, that although his feet may have been disabled, he showed up at that gate every day to prove that his hands still work. 
And if you are careful, you will allow some well, unusable feet well, well, yeah. to cause you to act as if you have unusable hands, yeah. unusable mind, unusable mouth, unusable heart. We will let one thing cause us to sit still. Bible says that the only problem he had was that he was deprived of foot and even he found a way around that. Jonathan said that he got, he got a ride every day. Oh, talking about his condition. Sometimes we've got to understand that that which we've claimed is a paralysis isn't a paralysis. It's merely an obstacle. That which we've declared as a paralysis is only an inconvenience. That which we've declared as a paralysis is really just a reroute. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Uh, um, we only don't understand this concept when it comes to the work of the church. Let you not have a ride to your job. You're going to call somebody. You're going to try to Uber. You're going to try to lift. You're going to send the church van work. Let you not have a ride to your job. And you're going to call that job. Listen, my car ain't starting today. I got to get, I promise I'll be there. Just, just, just you know, hold on a minute. Right, you, whatever you need to do. Okay, all right. Let, let your kid need something for school and you ain't really got it like that. You're going to find a way to rob Peter, to pay Paul, hope John don't find out, so your kid have whatever they need. But when it comes to the work of the church, whole lot of chloros, right? Being deprived of the feet. I got this one problem, so I can't do nothing. Talking about a crippling condition here. If I'm going to be giving the Lord the best that I got, mm -hmm. I got to get beyond the excuses. I got to get beyond my condition. I got to get beyond what it is that's stopping me from serving Him. Bible says that He's delivered to this gate. They they drop Him off. He's got to ride every day. Why? Because that's His job. That's what the text says. Brother Leo, he goes there and he does what? He begs for alms. I wish you could. Right. He shows up, can't walk. Right. But somehow he gets a ride to go beg. Right. Oh my God. Listen, I want you to see this concept in its totality here, right? Uh, so I need you to understand that there are two uh, Hebrew words that the Jewish uh, uh, used uh, uh, that you need to understand if this text is going to connect for you. Uh, the first word is uh, Tedesca. All right? Now, this is a Hebrew word that means philanthropy or charity. Uh, for, for the Jewish community, uh, philanthropy or, 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 uh, or charity was a form of social justice. Oh, oh goodness. Uh, they believed uh, that giving to people was the will of God. But they saw it as much more than a financial transaction. It was building uh, relationships, not only in those who were receiving, but those who were giving. That's correct. But the second thing that you need to understand is mitzvah. Right? Now, second word is mitzvah. Mitzvah is any one of the 613 commandments or, 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 or ordinances that, that the Jews had to live by. Right? Uh, mitzvah uh, uh, simply means a commandment. Right? Uh, you're familiar with the term bar mitzvah. Right? When a Jewish boy turns 13. Bar mitzvah literally means son of the commandment. In other words, he's finally old enough to follow the commandments. He's old enough to know between right and wrong now. Right? So, 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 uh, uh, the maximum contribution of the mitzvah, of the commandment, right, according to the Tedesca, is 20% of your income. Mm -hmm. 
let me let me just let me just clear this up before we move. Uh, the, we, the East Side of the, uh, the, the leadership of the East Side Church of Christ, we have not put a cap on your giving. If you'd like to give uh, everything that you have, uh, just what, just what you know. This this is not applicable to you. This cap. <laughs> the maximum contribution of the mitzvah could be only 20% of the net income of, 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 of what you brought home. And this is because the rabbis had to limit the giving to no more than one-fifth or 20% because they understood that extreme generosity may eventually cause a person to become needy. Goodness gracious. They understood that extreme generosity could be could cause a person to become needy. Uh, in other words, if I keep doing for you every day, when will you ever learn to do for yourself? I want you to see this. The commandment was to give to people, to help people. Black Sunday, right? We're going to go help some folk when church is over, right? But what they were teaching them was, if you keep giving all that you have, you're going to find men like this man. This man was begging these men because he knew that they would have a religious and a cultural and a moral obligation to give. The Bible says that, 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 that verse number uh, three, uh, who's seen Peter and John about the, to enter the temple? He asked them for alms. Asked them for money. And this is important because this is where we see uh, uh, the crippling condition lead us into a challenging conversation. Look at the Bible. Uh, verse number three. When they're going into the temple, he begins to ask them for alms. Look at verse four. It says, and fixing his eyes on him, this is Peter, with John, Peter said to him, look at us. Hmm. Verse five says, so he gave them, he's this is the man giving uh, Peter and John his attention. And he did it, why does the text say? Because he expected to receive something. Amen. What did that rabbi say? Well, well. A challenging conversation based upon a crippling condition. Peter and John realized the condition that this man was in. And they realized he might have been in that condition and, and not even know any better. It's just the condition he was in, right? And so what they decided to do was, rather than just see somebody in need and walk by, they said, let's talk about it. Peter says to him, look at me. Now, this may mean nothing to you. How often do y'all tell people, look at me, when you're not mad? <laughs> All right. That's typically something we reserve for our children. When they aren't giving us eye contact, right? They've been, look at me, I'm talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. Right, look at me, right? But Peter says, look at me. I want you to understand, he, he, he has to ask this man to look at him because the implication of the text is that as the man was asking, the proper way to ask was to ask in a way in which to never know who gave it to you. So his head would have been down and his hand up. Yeah. Only thing he would have seen of Peter and John coming is their feet. Yeah. My Lord, oh, yeah. I wish I had four or five folk in here who understand what it's like to be so bad off and so much in need that I really don't care who helped me. I just need some help. I don't care who, who it is or what their name is. I just need somebody to stop by and check on me and to help me in my darkest hour. His head is down, but his head is up. Yes. Goodness gracious. And, and Peter says, look at me. Uh -huh. Now, I need you to understand what this man would have been risking. It was against the cultural norm to make eye contact with the one who was helping you. So if he lifts his eyes, the Bible says he was what, expecting something. By him lifting his eyes and making eye contact with Peter and John, he had to believe that whatever they gave him was going to be enough for him to not have to beg no more today. 
because when he lifted his head, he was going to be escorted away from the beautiful gate. Good God. Yeah. And so what he did was, Peter says, look at me. And Peter knew what he was asking. What we see in this conversation, don't miss this church, is not a conversation about alms, it's not a conversation about giving, it's not a conversation about his condition, it's not a conversation about tone of voice, it's not a conversation about cultural norms, it is a conversation about faith. Peter is saying to him, do you have enough faith to think that I can give you enough? And that man has to decide that I have enough faith in these feet to risk it all. Sometimes, church, Paul puts it like this. He says, so, so, so uh, we, he says we see uh, 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 partially or dimly in a mirror, right? Uh, he says that in 1 Corinthians. He says, but eventually... It'll make a little more sense, right? Uh, sometimes as God comes to your life, to work on your life, he's asking you, do you trust me without me having to show you all of me? You, you're not seeing it. You're not seeing it. He's saying, if I, do you know me well enough when I walk up on you, Charles, that you can look at my feet and say, oh, that's Jesus. What does that mean? Do you know God well enough to where when a small thing starts moving, you can say, that ain't nobody but God. Do you know him well enough to say, I was trying this other stuff, but here comes God. I'm going to pass on that. Because I know what he can do. This is a conversation about, about faith. Look at me, he says. And Jesus is saying to us today, God is saying to us, the Spirit is nudging us, and he's saying, look at me. All right. All right. Are you willing to risk everything for me? Yes. Are you willing to give me the best that you got? Why? Because I'm going to give you the best. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yes. Bible says that he's, he's asking for for alms. He's asking for money. And he sees the feet and they, they tell him to, he said, look at me. Mm. Bible says he intently looks back at them. Mm -hmm. He's locked in with that way. Because he's expecting something. Mm -hmm. As you come to know God oh, yes. for who God is, yes, it will inform your expectations. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about setting the bar low. I love the way Vincent Tinto, sociologist from Syracuse, says no one rises to low expectations. But when I come to know who God is, when I come to know that he can do exceedingly and abundantly, I can start to expect something. And as that expectation goes up, church, I don't want you to miss this. I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about dollar amount. I'm not talking about something always great and grand. I'm talking about setting the bar so high, Sister Bruce, that if it ain't God, I don't want it. Amen. When's the last time you said, listen, I, I know you'd like to help me, but, but, but only God can fix this. Yeah. Yeah. Says he lifts his head and he's looking at them and he's expecting something. It's a, it's a challenging conversation, Rodney. Somebody here this morning is, has, is, is debating whether or not you're going to lift up your head and risk it all. You say to yourself, I, God is telling me, look at me. You've been standing at this gate begging for a job. I got something for you. And you think you got it figured out. I got another job already, Lord. And he's saying, maybe, maybe he's saying to you, are you willing to risk it all? Let that go and let me make the one you want better. All right. Somebody is waiting to look up. God is saying to you, look at me. And you're saying, Lord, I got my head down. I've been working on, on this relationship right here. And he's saying, no, no, I need you to look at me. Are you willing to let that go? I got something better for you. Lord, I've been, I, I found a way to cope. It's in this bottle. It, it's in this drug. It's in this habit. It's in this addiction. And he's saying, if you just look at me, 
I can give you peace that passes all understanding. It's a challenging conversation, and the conversation is what about faith, but you need to be asking yourself this morning, am I giving him the best that I got? He asks this man this question because he knew that the man was there every day. And he knew what begging meant to the man. <laughs> Listen, some of us, some of us struggle uh, with being that man yeah. because we've become so good at being needy mm. that we aren't interested in being healthy. Mm. What Peter has to do in that moment is he has to make a determination. Is this this man's past or is this this man's pattern? Uh, yes, yes. See, God will he'll take care of your past. Right? He'll take care of your past. Right? We, we struggle to let folk get over their past. But he'll take care of your past for you. But the question is, is this your, is this your past or your pattern? Uh. Your past is what you used to do. Yes. Your pattern is what you keep on doing. And sometimes we struggle because we mislabeled the two. I'm still doing it, but I call it my past. No, that's your pattern. And you holding something to get somebody that they don't do no more, that's not a pattern, that's their past. And so Peter has to make a decision. Is this this man's pattern or his past? And with one decision to lift his head, the man moved from pattern, good God, to past. May I submit to you this morning, if you're here this morning, and finding yourself in the middle of a pattern, one decision, one lifting of your head can move you from pattern to past. Challenging conversation, but he engages with them. Look at the text. I, I'm just about done here. Um, verse number four, Peter says, look at us. Verse 5 says, so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Verse 6 says, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. Peter says, I really hope you didn't lift your head thinking I had some money to give you. I, I know what you've been asking other folks for, but I don't have that. He says, but what I do have, I give you. Peter says, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The Bible says he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones <laughs> received strength. told you last week that this is Luke talking to us. And this is very important because Luke was a physician. And so we get details that we wouldn't have gotten other places where he says that his feet bones and his ankle bones were strengthened. Well, why, why is that important? It's important because this is the result of a life-changing confrontation. He said that his feet bones were strengthened. <clears throat> your feet are at the very foundation of your body. It's nothing lower than your feet. Right? His feet bones were strengthened. In other words, Rodney, he was now able to stand. But then Luke says, not only were his feet strengthened, but his ankles were strengthened. I wish you could see. So your feet are at the very bottom, the very foundation. What connects your feet to your body are your ankles. Should, you know, typically. Right? So what he's saying is this man was able to stand but by fixing his ankles, he was able to stand on his own. 
Mm. No. Maybe, 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 believe it or not, you can stand and not be able to stand on your own. Mm. Anybody ever gone through some physical rehab? Yeah. Yeah. But you, Chico, you ever had to learn to walk again? Where, where you stay? Anybody ever taught a kid to walk and they can stand? Yeah. But the right? You gotta you gotta make sure that they're not gonna fall, right? Because they're not strong enough. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. By pulling him up. He gave him the ability to stand and to be secure. Mm -hmm. Church, let me encourage you if you find yourself standing this morning, you need to add some security yes. to your stand. You believe it, act like you believe it. Mm -hmm. You trust God, act like you trust God. You, 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 you say he will live like it. The Bible says that this man put out his hand, lifted up his head. He was expecting something. And I love the way the text says here, uh, Brother Jones, he said that, uh, said that Peter uh, 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 grabbed him by his right arm. Is that what your Bible said? Grabbed him and pulled him up, told him, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, right? Arise. The man never asked to walk. Mike, believe it or not, every day when that man showed up, couldn't walk. Never asked to walk. That's us. At some point in your life, you will, you will finally sit down and realize how much time we've spent asking for stuff that we never really needed. But God has a way of giving you what you need, even though they wasn't really what you wanted. The man thought that he needed money to sustain him. But when Peter pulled him up, gave him some, something far greater. He said, listen, I ain't got no silver, I ain't got no gold, but I got something for you. All right. cool. And what I, what I have, uh. I give to you, is better. Amen. A life-changing confrontation. Why is this confrontational? Well, because if you are going to ever give the Lord the best that you got, at some point, who you want to be has to confront who you are. At some point, who you want to be has to say to who you are, this just ain't going to work no more. Yeah, yeah. We got to do something different. Yeah. We got to stop holding out our hands and try to figure out how to use our feet. I got to stop being this person that I know is not right, that I know is not good, that I know is not holy. If I'm ever going to be the tomorrow me, I've got to confront the, the today me. Life-changing confrontation. He says to him, oh, right in the name of Jesus, the Bible says, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately, somebody say immediately. Amen. Somebody say immediately. Amen. Listen, I know this man didn't understand how this happened. I've been getting a ride to the gate. I ain't never walked before in my life, and all of a sudden, some joker come and pull me up by the arm, and immediately, I, has, he, has God ever blessed you like that where it don't really make no sense? You can't really add it up. I don't know how I got this job. I don't know how I got this house. I don't know why he's sick. I don't know why he's dead. I don't know why they worked out for my favor. Well, that's because he can do some immediately stuff in your life. And I stopped by here this morning to tell somebody who's waiting on God. Just keep on waiting. And eventually, he's going to pull you up by your right arm. And immediately, he'll make some stuff good in your life. Life changing confrontation. You need to let your tomorrow you confront your today you and see where it gets you. I love the way the Bible says, you can read it uh, at your own leisure, but the Bible says that he went on after that happened, and the Bible says he went to church. Okay. Y'all don't, y'all, okay. Y'all think I'm praying with you. Uh, look at the text. Uh, verse number uh, uh, seven, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up. He act like he was glad that God did what he did for him. Some of us struggle for the we, Some of us struggle to get blessing number two because we never learned to be a preacher for blessing number one. 
God gave him some feet. Bible says he leaped up. Good God Almighty. Some of us, he would have gave us our feet. We'd be like, well, I don't really want to go nowhere. I just, I like labor. No, Bible says he leaped up. He was like, look at these no feet. Yeah. Leaped up. He was appreciative. Although it was not what he asked for. Goodness gracious, church, understand this as it comes to your blessings. That just because you don't understand it don't mean you ain't supposed to enjoy it. Amen. So he, verse number 8, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them. He, he said, y'all going to church? Y'all going to go pray? I'm going with you. You ever just praise God to whether you're at work or at home or thank you or, or, or whatever you think? Just yeah. McNeely, God bless you. I know where it came from. Yeah. Every good and perfect gift come from that one, two, fifth row. Uh, I appreciate it. So, so have you ever just been blessed in such a way or lived in such a way or just been worshiping or just been singing a song and other people were encouraged by what you were doing because God had blessed you? Y'all okay. ain't never been you keeping your praise to yourself. He said, hey, y'all going to church? He said, I'm going with you. Look at verse number, uh, number, number nine. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. I'll say that again. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Listen, the people, the people said, is that the same one that was outside, baby? People gonna say that about you when God does what He's gonna do for you. They gonna say, "Is that the same one? Who, is that the same one who kept getting up here every Sunday asking for prayers about their job they're going through, on their job they're struggling, on their job having problems? Or is that the same one that just got up and said that the Lord just blessed them with a brand new job or with a new opportunity, or now they somebody's boss? Okay, uh, you gonna be the same one who gets up and says, "Thank God Almighty, I, I'm engaged. I finally met the love of my life." Is that the same one who's been praying about the storms they've been going through? I love just to uh, ask or hear when people say. Lord, I, prayer of thanksgiving. Yeah. I love those. Yeah. Because all you're saying with the prayer of thanksgiving is, I've been struggling. Yes. And he heard me. Yes. Sister Bruce and he did something about it. Yeah. And, and I got enough sense to say thank you. Yeah. Says that he walked in with them. He was walking in and, and praising God. He walked in with a praise. Oh, yeah. good God. He walked in. Did nobody have to rev him up? Did nobody have to encourage him? Had nobody have to sing his song? Did nobody have to get the right note? Did nobody have to dodge him? Did nobody have to clap to get him to clap? He just understood where God had brought him from. And he understood what his yesterday was like compared to his today. And at some point in your life, there ain't nobody who have to rev you up. Ain't nobody who have to sing your song. Preach ain't going to have to preach your text. Ain't nobody who have to nudge you. It ain't going to have to be jumping in here. You won't come up in here just thankful that it ain't yesterday. Walk in, life changing, life changing confrontation. Verse 10, and then I'm done. It says, Then they knew <laughs> it was him. That's what the text says. Then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. Look at this. Then they <laughs> were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to. Two things I want you to see here, and I'll close. First of all, something is wrong with you when you can't celebrate somebody else's blessing. Amen. Something, something really wrong with you. Something really, really, really wrong with you. When somebody else's blessing, you ain't got that good to say. Amen. You ain't have. I was, I was giving uh, the, uh, Candace them hard time yesterday. I didn't know they, they uh, well, I'll cat out the bag. They got a new truck. I guess they had it. I don't park over there, so I didn't see it. And we were going to toss and I looked at it and said, oh, look at, that's awesome. That's blessing assurance. That's great. Right? No malice in my heart. Genuinely happy because a hard working family was finally able to see the fruit of their labor. So what do I look like? My family works hard. We grind. We try to have nice things. Why would I be angry that God is just showing me that there's a way to pull it off? Yeah. What's wrong with you? Yeah. There's something wrong if you can't be happy with other folk. Yeah. Being, he walked in and they got happy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Another part of that, a coin of that dichotomy is this, is that 
you need to understand that what you're going through might be paramount to somebody else's growth. Oh, I'll say that again. What you're going through may be paramount to somebody else's growth. And the moment you decide I'm going to hoard my testimony, I'm going to hoard what God is, 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 is taking me through, and I don't show you where he brought me from, you might be robbing somebody else out of their own growth. Are you giving him the best that you got? Are you giving it to him? We, we, we have to understand that God is able. He's able to just come up and ask you to look at me. Some of us here today, God has asked you to look at him quite a while ago. He don't keep standing there waiting. Bible tells us in the book of Romans that there comes a point where he will give you up to a reprobate mind. But he's come to you and he said, look at me. In other words, he's saying, do you trust me? Do you have faith in me like I'm trying to have some faith in you? I want to encourage you this morning to lift up your head and risk it all. Whatever it is that's keeping you and your head down, it ain't worth it. It does not compare to him. Are you giving him the best that you got? And I know that that's hard sometimes. I know it's hard because we can become like that man at the gate. This is all we've known. I've done this for so long. This is all I know. And there's no other way for it to be done. This is just the way that I operate. Right? So I, I believe with all my heart. So there are some people, and when I say needy, I'm talking about spiritually speaking, emotionally speaking. There are some people who are needy, not even out of uh, intent, but out of comfort and out of history. This is what I do. This is what I've always done. But you need to understand that even in your difficulty, God will never put you in a situation that he can't manipulate for your good. May not feel good, may not look good, but it's for your good. Uh, explain it to you this way. Today is a big day. Uh, if you if you're a sports fan. Oh, let me let me back up. Uh, if you're a a Cincinnati Bengal fan or LA Ram fan, not a Cowboy fan. It's a big day. And it's a big day for us Lions. I just I just <laughs> I just explained it to you, that indirect blessing. So the Rams quarterback used to be our quarterback. We were real sorry, but he wasn't. And now he's about to go win, and I'm going to appreciate his blessing. I'm a, I'm a Detroit Ram today. Right? I just told don't block somebody else's blessing. If Matthew Stafford win today, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be happy for that man. Because I, I would have officers watching it. Lord knows what his stomach was like playing in it. We just been back, right? But there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing in football I think properly describes the way God won't let you get into that uh, in a bad spot. Uh, Y'all familiar with a fellow named Peyton Manning? Yeah. Peyton Manning, uh, a bad bill fella, but yeah. Uh, Peyton Manning was the, was the master uh, of, of, of uh, in-game at the line adjustments. Right? Some of y'all don't know football. At the line means when the man is bent over with the ball and the quarterback walking behind him. And he go hike, 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 hike. That's, that's the line. Okay? Right forward, he hiked the ball. Uh, in football, you can, you'll go up to the line and you have a play. Okay. Now, over time, that's changed. The way you get the play. The methodology. But there's still a play. Right? Back in my day, or maybe, you know, Brother Riddles, they... <laughs> He just looked at me like, you better not. <laughs> we had something called a huddle. Get everybody together, quarterback, give them the play, break. You go to the line, right? Nowadays, we're so sophisticated because of technology and stuff. You walk up to the line, and now, ain't no huddle. You just look over to the sideline. 
and the coach is over there just giving you some, some serious sign language, right? <clears throat> Different method, same outcome. I wish, I wish we could see that, because sometimes we struggle when methods go, but this is more efficient now. At the line, right? And you gotta play. Wide receivers know what they gonna do. Running back know what he gonna do. Linemen know what they gonna do. But when you call that play, it's before you see the defense. Oh, I wish somebody here had some plans before the enemy spoke into it. Huh? And sometimes, you can walk up to the line and the play that you're getting ready to run is going to go right into the hands of the defense. So what a good quarterback has to do is to evaluate the defense, the situation, the circumstances. Let me see what works. Let me see what won't work here. Let me make sure I don't put nobody in a bad situation. And so what the quarterback will do is he'll step back and he'll call what we call an audible. In other words, we were going to run this play, but y'all, now we about to run this play. Huh? Because the enemy was set up to stop this play, but ain't no way that joker going to be ready for this play. And the same thing is true in your life. As you step up to uh, the line in your life and you get ready to move forward to what it is that God has called you to do, giving him the best that you got every now and again, the Lord being your quarterback will step up to the line if you have the Holy Spirit in your ear sending you plays. And what he'll say is, I need you to read the defense. And what the Lord will do is he'll say, hold on, I got to call an audible. Because if you go that way, the enemy is waiting on you. I need you to go this way. And if you go that way, the enemy is waiting on you. I need you to come across the middle. And what you've got to understand is that when the quarterback calls the play, the success of the play is contingent upon everybody doing what the quarterback says. Good God. Sometimes in your life it's not that the Lord hadn't called an audible. You just want to run your own route. And when I understand that I have an all world, all heaven and earth quarterback, first team, undefeated, in the words of LeVar Ball, never lost. When I understand that, I have no problem running whatever play he calls. And I want to encourage you if you're here this morning to be listening for what the Lord is calling. But be flexible enough that if you step to the line with your number called and he needs to change the play and throw it to you later, that's where we struggle. Lord, I, could, I, could, I, I'm, I thought I was open. I, I saw that blessing. And he says, hold up, there's something down there that you don't see. There's a coverage back there that, that you, you ain't ready for. I can see it coming in event. Hold on, we're going to throw it to you next time. Let me, let me bless Tamiko right now. I'll be right, I'll be right back. All right. And you step back to that line again, and he calls your number, and he says, oh, wait, wait, now it's not the defense, now it's you. See, the other thing a quarterback can do is come up and see where there's a disadvantage and try to go to the advantage. Sometimes it's not the enemy that's stopping you from getting your number called. Sometimes it's you. What would cause a, 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 a quarterback to change? It, a lot of times fatigue. You are in no shape to catch the ball if I threw it to you anyway. What are you saying? Sometimes we ask God to give us stuff that we are in no shape to receive even if he gave it to us. And you've got to trust him enough and love him enough to allow him to quarterback your life. If you're with us this morning and you're not on our team, you're not on his team, if anybody else is calling your plays other than the Lord, you got a problem. You, you, you have a serious problem. And I want to invite you this morning to join our team. No tryouts needed. The Lord does all the adding and the, and the cutting. And, all, right? and we ain't got nothing to do with it. We just want to be your teammate. And we just want to rejoice as you score as well. Well, how do I join that team? When that team was established in Acts chapter 2, just a chapter before this, football, they call it an expansion draft. They just go grab people to, to build a team. And then over time, you have to grow that team. 
same thing happened in Acts chapter 2. They asked the question, what must we do to be saved? And they told them, come on and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sin. They weren't turning nobody down, when nobody turned away. In fact, Brother Reynolds, the roster grew, the Bible says, at the end of Acts chapter 2, that they kept adding to the church. It kept adding to the church. It kept, and today we're still adding to the church. The Bible said the Lord adds to the church. Amen. Daily. How do I do that? How do I get that? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent? Are, are you willing to say, this team I'm on ain't working? I need to be on his team. Whoever's been calling my plays, that's not God. I need to allow the Lord to order my steps. Are you willing to confess him? Right? In other words, are you willing to be aligned with him? Right? Going back to the same, 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 same analogy, are you willing to put on a jersey that has his name on it? Are you willing to allow people to know that you're on that team? Amen. I don't want you on my team if you ain't willing to wear a jersey. Amen. You ashamed to be on my team? That's God, right? If you uh, confess me before men, I confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, yes. I deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. If you're going to let folk know you're on my team, yeah. <laughs> I baptize you right now for the remission of your sins. But maybe you just need prayer. Maybe the Lord has asked you to look at me. You've been afraid to lift up your head. Yeah. Let's be standing. I want to give you an opportunity uh, to come and ask for prayer. Uh, ushers, ushers, if you can make your way down front. Uh, whatever it is that you need, you need to ask yourself this question. Am I giving him the best that I've got? And if not, why not? Oh Lord, never alone. Brother Gary talked this morning about rejoicing when others are blessed. Uh -huh. And then also he talks about the idea of suffering with others who are suffering, just being part of their family. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. And he wrote them because they had been struggling with that idea of familyship, of being the body of Christ. They were taking communion. But one was eating fat and fine, another was basically starving. He asked, did you have houses to live in? You have a place to eat on your own. He wanted us to know as Christians that we are one in Jesus Christ. He said, I received this from the Lord himself. He said, for I received the Lord that will also I deliver unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which was betrayed, he took bread. And when they were giving thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. At the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death to him till he come. But then he says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord and water shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So let every man examine himself, that he of that bread and drink of the cup. He said, For he that eat and drink on worth eat and drink of damnation himself, not to see in the Lord's body. Sometimes when we hear that, we just think about the body of Christ. But we are the body of Christ. Yeah. And so what he's saying is, as we partake of this, we take of this in fellowship with one with another. Not only with Christ, but we take it in solidarity with Brother Axton as he's suffering, with Sister Johnson as she's suffering, with Sister Turner as she is thankful for what God has done for her and her family. That's what we do. That's why it's a common union, a communion. And so we're going to give thanks for the bread, thanks for the cup, and thanks for the, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. Uh -huh. 
and that we're able as a family to come together in the body of Christ. Uh -huh. Father heaven, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather again as your children. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you we take this bread that represents his broken body, the cup and shed blood. We take it in the midst of this fellowship of Lord, as we are your children through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. In this name we say, Amen. 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 Apostle Paul will write to the church of Corinth again in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He said, For it's touching the ministering to the saints, it's superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the fullness of your mind, for which I boast of you to those in Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal have provoked very many. Yet he said, I have sent the brother least our boasting of you should be in vain in their behalf. He just simply was saying that he knew they already had a heart of giving. And he had boasted to other folks they already had given. Mm -hmm. Each side, even when I arrived here, and since I've been here, one of the things that has been said about each side, that the folks here have a heart of giving. Yeah. They give to the work so that those can't be touched by, by uh, the things that we do here. Amen. And so, as always, as leadership, we just thank you for your giving. Amen. And encourage you to keep on. Because although you give to the church here, you're really giving to the Lord to the things that you do. Amen. For Paul says, he says, every man, but I say, he which sows spark shall receive spiritually. He which is so is bounce which you receive bounce me. Let every man and every woman, let every Christian give according to their purposes in their heart. Not grudging or an obsessive, but God love a cheerful giver. Uh -huh. We're gonna give thanks and the brother's gonna pass the basket. You have the opportunity to give of God has prospered you. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our blessing. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you, Lord, for enabling us to be able to give back to you the portion of things you have blessed the world. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray, Lord, that as we give the things that we utilize to strengthen your kingdom, to have those in need, to touch this community. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. wanting to participate in the RACS project, please remain seated uh, once we dismiss after the congregational prayer so that we can give you information regarding the different projects. Amen? Amen. And the congregational Five. prayer goes, help us this week in everything that we do to allow our light to shine so that others may see your good works. Help us to grow together as one family in one faith, sharing one focus, in Jesus' name, amen. Heaven, I know of a place called heaven. 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 Oh, 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 oh,
Yeah. Oh, oh, 